okay so today we will be starting if the screen is not visible or i'm not audible to you all do let me know in between okay so today we'll be talking about rcf6 in rcf6 uh, the rest of the parts of the program have been covered so we'll today be dealing with the uh, reproductive and child health program 6 here we are going to cover about the universal immunization program mainly it's mainly about immunization afis okay evaluation and supervision of the program so we'll be talking about the universal immunization program the management of cold chain coverage and evaluation supervision surveillance of the vaccine preventable diseases and we'll be talking about adverse effects following immunization Okay, so I hope this is a topic which has been covered in, uh, you might have uh, read about immunization cold chain in a number of classes before. So it uh, can be a way of revision for you all. So we'll just take it, uh, take the topics one by one. So if I talk about, okay. So as you can see, this is about routine immunization. I, I'm not sure if you people have been to the health centers and if you people have gotten chance to uh, actually uh, practice uh, giving vaccines. Uh, so you will be in internship, you'll be getting chance to practice immunization. If I talk about the universal immunization program, okay. So uh, as you all know that the immunization program in India, it was started at the, uh, as the expanded program of immunization, right? It was started as EPI. And later on, like in 1985, it was modified into the universal immunization program. Okay. So uh, it runs under the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. And I hope you know what is immunization. I hope you know what is vaccination. It is one of the questions which is uh, very commonly asked in your exams, in your vivas, what is the difference between immunization and vaccination. So I'll uh, just tell you that vaccination is the administration of vaccines and immunization is both the administration of the vaccines as well as the development of immunity following the vaccine administration. So that is the difference between vaccination and immunization. So. Uh, UIP has been one of the largest public health programs, okay, and uh, the annual target was to cover 2.67 crore newborns and 2.9 crore pregnant women and to vaccinate children against six, against uh, the vaccine preventable diseases, which are uh, nine nationwide vaccine preventable diseases we are administering vaccines against and three subnationally. These are administered in specific districts, JE, Rota, and PCV vaccine. PCV vaccine has been recently launched in Delhi. So you should be knowing about this vaccine as well. Our, around 1.2 crore sessions are planned per year and around 29,000 cold chain points for storage and distribution of vaccines are present. <clears throat> Now two major milestones that have been achieved as a result of these uh, uh, you know, scaled up immunization programs in our country is one was when India was declared polio free that was on 27th of March 2014. Here Southeast Asia region of WHO including India it was certified polio free. And on 14th of July 2016, WHO certified India for eliminating maternal and neonatal illness. I hope you know what is the difference between disease control, disease elimination and disease eradication. You should be knowing the difference between these three as well as which diseases have been eliminated and which diseases have been eradicated. So you should be knowing that. If I talk about the new initiatives in the program, If 
Okay, there's some problem with the screen just now. So if I talk about the roadmap of vaccine introduction, since 2010, several new vaccines have been introduced in the country's universal immunization program. I'm not uh, able to get this in slideshow view, otherwise the screen is freezing. So we'll try to continue in this way only. So uh, <clears throat> earlier we had vaccines uh, under EPI, that was the expanded program on of immunization we had vaccine prevent we had uh, vaccines against six vaccine preventable diseases okay that included diphtheria pertussis tetanus tb polio and measles then in 2002 hepatitis b vaccine was administered as a pilot uh, project then j vaccine was introduced in 2006 and in 2010 the hepatitis b vaccine which was earlier uh, uh, started on a pilot basis was now scaled up nationwide as well as we introduced the second dose of measles. In 2011, pentavalent was uh, uh, introduced. Then in 2013, the second dose for JE was introduced. In 2015, that main, majorly to the uh, 2016, uh, in 2015, we introduced IPV and in 2016, uh, there was a switch from OPV to IPV. Okay, that is coming later on. Uh, and pentavalent was even scaled up in the entire country. In 16, we had the rotavirus vaccine was uh, introduced and there was a switch from trivalent uh, oral polio vaccine to bivalent oral polio vaccine and we started administering IPV, uh, okay, so as to compensate uh, the loss of strain that we are having. Then in 2017, we introduced the MR vaccine, the PCV vaccine, and the Japanese encephalitis vaccine. Okay, JE vaccine, uh, one time campaign strategy, it was to uh, administer single dose of JE vaccine targeting all children from uh, one to less than 15 years of age. Okay, and uh, it was included as in routine immunization, but only in districts which were where JE was endemic. The root and dose, it was given at uh, firstly at nine months and then at 16 to 24 months, 0.5 ml subcutaneous on the left upper arm. <laughs> Tetanus and diphtheria vaccine, the TD vaccine, now, increase in immunization coverage in children led to the shift in age group of diphtheria cases to school-going children and adults. We started immunizing children against the vaccine. So we started seeing a, a surge of cases in children and adults. Then tetanus and adult diphtheria, that is the TD vaccine, it has been recommended by the National Technical Advisory Group on Immunization in 2016. TT has been replaced by TD and will provide protection against both tetanus and diphtheria in adults. TD vaccine will replace the two doses of TT or single booster dose of TT given to pregnant women and booster doses at 10 and 16 years of age. Okay. So we have, we are replacing the TT vaccine with the TD vaccine. Then similarly, the inactivated polio vaccine launched on 30th of November 2015, initially in six states, expanded to all states by April 2016. Two doses of FIPV are given. I am sure you know this, given at six and 14 weeks of age. 
if we are giving an intramuscular dose, earlier we were only giving intramuscular dose. We were giving it 0.5 ml at 14 weeks IM. But then we saw that uh, if we give fractionated doses, if we give, give 0.1 ml, then also the immunity is uh, as good as is obtained by the intramuscular route. And furthermore, we are reducing the dose from 0.5 to 0.2 per child. So we started giving fractionated IPV at 6 and 14 weeks of age. 0.1 ml intradermal. <clears throat> Newer vaccines that were launched were rotavirus vaccines and pneumococcal vaccines. Uh, rotavirus was given at 6 and 14 weeks, pneumococcal at 6 and 14 weeks. And um, so the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine that we have started administering, we uh, give it after giving our pentavalent vaccine to the children aged 6 and 14. Uh, so you all know the national immunization schedule, nothing new in this. At birth, we are administering the BCG vaccine, OPV zero dose and hepatitis B birth dose. At 6, 10 and 14 weeks, we are going to give OPV, Penta and Rota. We are going to give on all three, 6, 10 and 14 weeks. Fractionated IPV on 6 and 14 weeks and PCV also on 6 and 14 weeks. Okay. 9 to 12 months, we are going to give MR first dose, J in endemic districts and PCV booster. Then 16 to 24 months, MR second dose, J again in endemic districts, GPT booster 1 and OPV booster at 6 to 24 months. 5 to 6 years, you have to give DPT second, a booster a second. 10 years, we are giving TD, 16 years TD. In pregnant females, TD 1, 2 or TD booster. If, the, if one dose has been given within the last three years. Okay. So a new launch that was seen on in um, recent uh, in recent years was the launch of mission indradhanush which was launched on 25th of december 2014 it was uh, it had the objective of reaching the unreached okay the population that uh, was unreached uh, for vaccination that was the objective to reach them, increasing full immunization coverage to 90% and sustain it through routine immunization. Uh, in, uh, when it was started, it was started in uh, six phases and 554 districts were covered. One of the flagship scheme under the, it was the, one of the flagship scheme under Gram Swar uh, Swaraj Abhiyan and extended Gram Swaraj Abhiyan. Intensified Mission Indradhanush. Intensified Mission Indradhanush uh, launched on 8th of October 2017 to ensure full immunization in selected districts and cities to more than 90% by December 2018. Four phases of the mission uh, reached to 2.53 crore plus children and 68 lakh pregnant women. Progress to be monitored at the highest level under proactive governance and timely implementation also known as Pragat. Okay. Now let's talk about the open vial policy. Now, what is open vial policy and which vaccines follow the open vial policy? So, a vaccine vial can be used at more than one immunization session up to four weeks, okay? We can use the vaccine vial uh, af even after one immunization session up in four weeks, that is 28 days. So the open vial policy is of 28 days and it is applicable to vaccines OPV, hepatitis, penta, okay? Not applicable to BCG, measles, and GE. Vaccine vial, uh okay so we can use these after uh, one session so we have to write the date and time of opening of the vial 
the date of opening of the vial of all of these vaccines so that uh, we know we can uh, count up to 28 days up to 28 days we can be still administered but provided the expiry date has not passed the vaccines have been stored under proper maintained cold chain bvm or the vaccine vial monitor has not reached the discard point proper aseptic technique has been used to withdraw all the doses the vaccine vial septum has not been submerged in water or contaminated in any way only then we can continue using the vaccine for the further sessions up till 28 days of opening of the vial So this is, uh, you all know this, so it's uh, not worth discussing here. Vitamin A, as we all know, is uh, given orally. BCG intradermal, the, the intramuscular. You, you should be knowing the national immunization schedule, and you should be knowing about each vaccine, the dose, root, site of administration. And obviously the time of administration, and if in case it has any diluent, whether it follows the open vial policy or not, okay, that much you should be thinking about each vaccine. Now, who is the fully immunized child? A fully immunized child is a child who has received one dose of BCG, three doses of DPT and OPV, and one dose of measles before one year of age. So we will call such a child as fully immunized has received one dose of BCG, three doses of DPT or PV, and one dose of measles. This gives the child the best chance for survival. If a dose is missed, then what to do? Give the dose at the next opportunity, irrespective of the time gap. Do not start the schedule all over again. Now, under FAQs, we, we can discuss about uh, the contraindications or especially what are not contraindications to routine immunization. If you um, have a child for immunization who complains of minor illnesses such as a URTI or diarrhea or mild fever, which is less than 38.5 degrees centigrade, okay, you can still administer, you can still follow the uh, NIS and you can still administer the vaccines. Similarly, um, allergy, asthma, prematurity, underweight newborn child, a malnourished child, a child who has been breastfed, a child with family history of convulsions, or a child who has been who has been on treatment with antibiotics, or a child with eczema, dermatosis, any localized skin infection, even in chronic diseases, and <clears throat> stable neurological conditions such as cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, or history of jaundice after birth. Even in these cases, these are not contraindications to routine immunization. <clears throat> so uh, obviously there has been inequity in immunization. This is an older data. We will uh, check for in the next phase of NFHS, but uh, as we all know, there has definitely is an inequity in immunization or even in the provision of healthcare services. And uh, I hope you know what is the difference between equality and equity, because that is important, okay? If, what does equality means? Equality means giving equal amount of things to everyone, okay? Suppose we have a rural area, we have an urban area, and we are giving equal number of resources to both the rural and urban area. We are saying we are maintaining equality. But is equality desired in our healthcare system? No. What we desire is equity. What does equity mean? Giving what is required in which scenario. Okay? And maintaining that uh, so that there is not much difference between the rural and urban areas. If a rural area needs more, we are going to give it more resources as compared to an urban area or vice versa, whatever is required in certain scenarios. So that is the difference between equality and equity.
these have been the major uh, reasons why children are missing their doses uh, of routine immunization. <clears throat> it's mainly because uh, uh, there, there is lack of awareness or lack of information or they are apprehensive about an adverse event following immunization or operational gap, then there is refusal or certain other conditions such as the child is traveling or not available. So these have been the major reasons for this lack of uh, this uh, missing out on immunization of children 12 to 23 months. Okay, so another topic that we are going to carry on in this is the waste generation in cases of uh, vaccination sites or immunization sessions. You have certain uh, waste that are generated. So how are those to be discarded? Suppose 80 syringes to be used where safe disposal is possible. Anywhere where safe disposal of these syringes is possible, we are going to admin, uh, use 80 syringes. Now, waste uh, in case of an immunization session might consist of what? It, it might consist of the packaging materials, syringes, needles, broken or discarded vials. So where to throw what? I hope you all have had classes on biomedical waste management and you all know uh, which colored bins are used for dis, uh, <clears throat> discarding which kind of waste. So just to help you recall, general waste is thrown in black bins. If you have any infectious waste, which is plastic, you are going to throw it in red bin. If you have any infectious waste that is non-plastic, you are going to throw it in yellow bin. And any metallic shops are going to go in the white. And any uh, glass ampules or glass waste is going to go in the blue colored box. Okay. So... know this okay. now this yellow waste is either incinerated or deeply deep buried red waste is either autoclaved or it is like sent for recycling and this should not be sent to landfills why are we not sending it to landfills because it is infectious plastic waste okay the white bin or uh, where we have uh, these waste shops, including metals, they are to go into uh, autoclaving or dry heat sterilization, which is followed by shredding, mutilation, or encapsulation. Glassware waste is disinfected or autoclaved and then sent for recycling, microwaving, or recycling. Now remember, all vaccines tend to lose potency on exposure to heat above 8 degrees centigrade. Okay, this is an important question, which we just discussed, the discarding of waste from an immunization site. So you should be knowing how, uh, where to this, what are, what are the different types of waste that may be generated during an immunization session and where to discard. Okay. Now we should be knowing which are heat sensitive vaccines, which are cold sensitive vaccines. It is an important question, which are light sensitive vaccines. Okay, so <clears throat> all vaccines tend to lose potency on exposure to heat above 8 degrees centigrade. Some vaccines lose potency when exposed to freezing temperatures. So these are the T series vaccine, all vaccines which have T in their names they are seen to lose potency when exposed to freezing temperature. Some vaccines are sensitive to light, such as the BCG vaccine or the measles vaccine. Now, if a vaccine is damaged due to light or due to temperature, then the damage is irreversible. Physical appearance of the vaccine may remain unchanged, but the potency might get lost. <laughs> so if I talk about the heat sensitivity, Okay, what is the most heat sensitive vaccine and what is the least heat sensitive vaccine? So as we have already discussed, the T series vaccines are freeze sensitive vaccines. So definitely they are going to be least sensitive for uh, heat. And most sensitive is, most heat lapel vaccine is OPV, but DPT is 
reconstituted. It is more heat turbine as compared to OPT. Okay, then measles and then your uh, TCD vaccine. Okay. So the free sensitive vaccine. Free sensitive vaccine, hepatitis B is the most um, free sensitive vaccine, uh, followed by JPT, DT, and TT. So if you have, if your vaccine has flocules or if your vaccine appears to be frozen, you have to discard these vaccines, okay? Because these are sensitive to <clears throat> colder temperatures, to lower temperatures, and they would lose their potential. So, <clears throat> for uh, these vaccines, which tests do we conduct? We conduct the shake test to know if the vaccine can be used or it has to be discarded. Now, another important thing that we should be knowing is the VVM or the vaccine vial monitor. So you see that in majority of the vaccines, in all, all the vaccines, we have the symbol of a circle and a square and, uh, inside the circle. So if the inside square is lighter as compared to the outer circle the vaccine can be utilized it is good if it becomes lighter but it is still it, it becomes darker but it is still light as compared to the circle the vaccine can still be utilized then if the square becomes similar to the color of the circle then it should not be utilized it is bad and if it becomes discarded, uh, it, if it becomes darker than the you know outer circle, then also it has to be discarded. So, what is the discard point? Um, in case of BVM, it is when the inner square becomes of uh, gets of the same color as the outer circle. Now, cold chain. What is cold chain? So cold chain is a system. Cold chain is a system of transporting and storing vaccines at recommended temperature from the point of manufacture to the point of use. Okay, <clears throat> from the manufacturing site to the site of usage. This is the system of storing as well as transporting vaccine at recommended temperature. All vaccines. So we have already studied. All vaccines, they lose their potency and uh, the damage is irreversible. So this is how the cold chain is managed. We have the vaccine manufacturer, which manufactures the vaccine. It is, <clears throat> it is brought to the primary vaccine store. And then finally, through the intermediate vaccine stores, it reaches the health center, the health post, and finally, the child and the mother. Challenges, what are the challenges in maintaining cold chain? Definitely the maintenance of the cold chain, the maintenance of the transporting facilities, the maintenance of proper temperature, then limited storage capacity versus adequacy of stock. Okay. We do not have, uh, supposedly, it can be a challenge that there isn't much storage capacity of the vaccine. For uh, managing this cold chain, for maintaining this cold chain, we require electricity supply because we are running um, cold chain equipments, for example, your freezers and uh, ILRs. So they have to be uh, provided with electricity. Arrangement of diluents, freezing of ice packs, other matching supplies, 
whatever other supplies these are all the challenges which we encounter when we try to manage our cold chain now what are the cold chain equipments first is the walk in freezer walk In freezers are preheated freezers so these are at national and state levels mainly and they store temperatures from minus the storage temperature is minus 15 to minus 25 two identical cooling units and a power backup generator there is an alarm and hooter system in case this temperature uh, varies from the desired temperature range that is minus 15 to minus 25 we have an alarm and hooter system now what is uh, WIFs used for they are used for freezing of ice packs and they are used for storage of bulk quantity of OPE but only till the district level not below that then the deep freezer deep freezer has a temperature of minus 15 to minus 25 top opening lid it is used for storing of opv but only till the district level as i told you and also for freezing of ice packs hold over time is 26 hours at 32 degrees centigrade storage capacity we do not need to know Okay, I'll just tell you this. Now, deep freezer, freezer is just applied under the immunization program. They have a top opening lid. These are available in two models with a capacity of 300 liters and 140 liters. Okay, 300 liters and 140 liters. The 300 liter capacity freezer at district headquarters are supplied for storage of OPV and for preparation of ice packs. The 140 is meant only for preparation of ice packs. So we have 140 and 300. 300 more, we can uh, freeze our ice pack as well as we can store OPV. But in uh, 141, we are only going to prepare the ice pack. Okay, in case of power failure, 26 hours, 32 degrees centigrade, the same thing that we have already studied. So walk-in freezers, deep freezers, then we have the ice line refrigerator. Now ice line refrigerator, it is top opening refrigerator for better holding of cool air, but you can also have front opening uh, ILRs. Okay. What is the temperature? It is two to eight degrees centigrade. Okay, and they can maintain the temperature below eight up till 18, uh, 14 uh, hours. If you have, th this is the hold over time. So you should be knowing what is hold over time actually. Uh, Equipped hold over time is the time in um, for which the equipment can maintain its cold chain temperature after eight are available in two sizes of continuous supply. Okay. They are available 300 and 140. What is the sequence of storage? <clears throat> what is the sequence of uh, how are ice packs actually frozen in the deep freezer? So you should never store uh, any vaccine in the deep freezer. Only above the district level or till the district level, we store OPV, but you should not store other vaccines, okay? So as you can see, this is how the ice packs are arranged in the deep freezer, okay? So um, one layer is vertical, then the other layer, as you can see in this uh, here, so one layer is like this and then one layer is like this so this is how it is this is how it is stored okay so um we store the ice packs only up till half of the height of the large component and they are stored in a crisscross manner as we see why is this followed so as to maintain the air circulation inside the equipment so this is how we are storing them okay one 
uh, layer like this and then one layer crisscrossing the lower layer storage of vaccines in ilr so you just go and read about these okay how, what is the sequence of storage of vaccines so definitely we are going to store the most heat labile vaccines at the lower part of the ilr because that would be the coldest part <clears throat> so this is how we are going to uh, store it we store all vaccines in baskets okay and store diluents in baskets for 24 hours before next session keep space between the boxes and we have thermometers hanging okay we have thermometer hanging in the basket and the temperature is monitored to be between plus two to plus eight degrees centigrade in order top to bottom so this is how we are going to arrange them according to their heat sensitivity and then discard any frozen uh, hepatitis b dpt tt and dt vaccine why because these are t-series vaccines and we have already discussed that they are free sensitive vaccines and you have to have space between the boxes so that a is easily circulated This is how vaccines are stored. These are stored in proper baskets and we have storage according to their heat sensitivity. Now after ILR, another cold chain equipment is the cold box. Now the cold boxes, these are used for transportation of vaccine. And in case we have any emergency, in case there is no, no electricity supply, in that case, they can be used as um, uh, they can be used for storage of vaccines and as well as of ice packs. The holdover time is 90 hours for 5 liters and 6 days for 20 liters cold box at 43 degrees centigrade ambient temperature if the cold box is not opened at all. Okay, if we do not open this at all, then <clears throat> if we have a 5 liter cold box, the holdover time is 90 hours and if we have a 20 liter cold box, it is 40. <clears throat> it is uh, uh, six days. Yeah. Place conditioned ice packs at the bottom and sides before loading the vaccines. We place ice packs and then we load the vaccine. Keep a thermometer inside the cold box. <clears throat> then we have a smaller equipment known as the vaccine carrier. It is used for carrying vaccines. Okay, Around 16 to 20 vials we can carry vials as well as their diluents from PHC to the outreach session sites. Okay. Now we have four conditioned ice packs. We also have a vaccine carrier with two conditioned ice packs, but we do not use it. Okay. We uh, do not recommend the usage of that. So we use four conditioned ice pack uh, vaccine carrier. The inside temperature is maintained at 2 to 8 degrees centigrade for 12 hours. Close the lid of the carrier tightly. Never use any day carrier with two ice packs or thermos flasks for carrying the vaccine because the cold chain uh, is not properly maintained. Okay, how to pack a vaccine carrier? So, firstly, you have to prepare ice packs. Okay? You have to prepare ice packs. Fill the ice pack with water to mark. Check water level before every use. Do not add salt to this water. Okay, we have a mark on the ice pack and up till that mark, we add water. Fisk the stopper and screw on the cap tightly. Make sure the ice pack does not leak. Wipe the ice pack dry and place it in the deep freezer. Now place fr uh, frozen ice packs in open till they sweat. Some condensation or droplets, okay? So we do not directly uh, put in a frozen ice pack uh, in the vaccine carrier because they can damage the free sensitive vaccine. So before that, what we do is we keep them in the open till we have certain drops on the body of the ice pack, which is known as conditioning of these frozen ice packs. Check if an ice pack has been conditioned by shaking and listening for water. Okay, so when you 
the shake the ice pack you'll he hear a crackling sound which will tell you that the ice pack has been uh, conditioned now place four conditioned ice packs against the side of the carrier place the plastic bag containing all vaccines and diluents in the center of the carrier okay so this is how you are gonna make a vaccine carrier collect vaccines in the carrier on the session day okay vaccine carrier may not store vaccines effectively beyond 12 hours do not drop or sit on the vaccine carrier do not leave it in sunlight and do not leave the lid once back okay okay so this is what you should be knowing so anytime that you get a chance to visit the museum or anytime that you get a chance to visit we actually do not have uh, ilrs in our museum whenever you get a chance to visit uh, the cold chain points in our department just see that you can see how we are conditioning the ice packs how these ice packs are arranged how the vaccines are arranged how is the record of temperature maintained how is this temperature maintained and how is the charting done and how do we check for cold damage so it should be knowing these okay <clears throat> So to continue, we are going to talk now about the adverse events following vaccination. What is AEFV? It is an untoward temporarily associated event following immunization that might or might not be caused by the vaccine or the immunization process. Okay, so it is an untoward uh, temporarily, uh, temporarily associated event which is followed following which occurs following immunization but it might or might not be related to the immunization process or the vaccine so if we talk about afi mostly the vaccines are safe and effective life-threatening adverse events are extremely rare mild side effects are commonly seen and can be self-limiting and easily manageable benefits of immunization greatly outweigh the risk of afi Majority are due to unsafe injection practices and procedures. Now we have AEFIs, we classified them into one is the serious adverse events and the non serious. Serious is anything which uh, requires hospitalization. So, fatal or life threatening, persistent or significant disability, prolonged hospitalization, or leads to birth defects, congenital anomalies. And we have the mild ones or the Mm. Okay, so these are the serious AEFIs. Okay, we are not going to say the severe AEFI, but the serious AEFI. Now, the reaction can be a local reaction, it can be a systemic reaction, it can be an allergic reaction to the vaccine. Local reaction <clears throat> are very common after vaccine administration. Local reaction include mainly pain, erythema, indurition. It is more seen with uh, vaccines such as uh, the DTP, DPT vaccines, okay, then uh, hepatitis B and pneumococcal vaccines. Frequency of local reaction increase with subsequent dose and frequently administered doses. Local reaction may be partly ameliorated by ice application and paracetamol. <clears throat> Systemic reaction, fever is the most common systemic reaction. And like local reaction, fever is more common with whole cell pertussis vaccine and aluminum adjuvenated vaccines, okay? So in vaccines where we use the aluminum adjuvant, we see that fever becomes more common uh, side effect of those vaccines. However, unlike local reactions, it usually declines with increasing age and increasing number of doses. Okay, so local reactions, they increase with increasing age and dosage and systemic reactions decrease with age and doses. Administration of paracetamol at the time of vaccination and later on, uh, later on a regular basis is helpful and indicated especially in children predisposed to febrile seizures. Okay, so we administer PCM. I hope you know the dose, 15 milligram per kg of body weight. We administer after we uh, prescribe in case uh, 
and AFI, of course. Um, then fever due to vaccination does not usually last for more than 48 hours and fever persisting beyond this time should be evaluated for other causes. Allergic reaction, it includes general allergy like uh, urticaria, wheezing, or it may be uh, a bit uh, on the serious side like swelling of mouth and throat, difficulty breathing, hypertension and shock, which mainly occurs in very occurs very very rarely and it is due to vaccine antigen commonly due to other vaccine constituents like it is mainly due to the antigen in the vaccine or due to the other constituents okay we have certain stabilizers or preservatives in the vaccine which cause an allergic reaction to the person who has been immunized so these AEFIs, they have been classified into different types. We have five different types of AEFIs. One is the vaccine reaction, okay, which is due to the vaccine reaction, an event which is caused by the active component of the vaccine, okay, either the vaccine or any of the component of the vaccine. Any reaction that occurs, this is known as the vaccine reaction. This is due to the inherent property of the vaccine, <clears throat> okay. Then we have AEFI due to program error where we have an error in vaccine preparation, handling, or administration. Coincidental, an event that occurs after immunization but is not caused by the vaccine. This is due to a chance of temporal association, okay? So just because it uh, is followed, well, uh, temporality is being followed, uh, because it for, uh, it occurs following immunization, we say that uh, it is due to immunization, but it is not, and it is a purely coincidental event. Okay, for example, high-grade fever following DPT vaccine is because of the aluminum adjuvant that we use in the DPT vaccine, and it is a vaccine reaction uh, type of AEFI. Program error, for example, if we use unsterile injections, a bacterial abscess occurs, that is due to program error. Coincidental pneumonia after OPV administration. So OPV administration and pneumonia are not interrelated. <clears throat> so this is a coincidental event. Injection reaction caused by anxiety or the pain from the injection rather than the vaccine. Okay. So for example, a teenager faints after immunization. This is a type of injection reaction and unknown. The cause of the event cannot be determined. Okay. So it is vaccine product related, vaccine quality defect related, immunization error related, immunization anxiety related, or coincidental. This is the WHO definition of AEFI. Okay, so vaccine product related, as I said about DPT, quality defect related, sometimes uh, it may occur as a chance that the vaccine is not uh, of the quality or there is some defect in the manufacturing and uh, that leads to AFIs in the people who have been vaccinated. Immunization error related, for example, I said, told you about bacterial abscess, immunization anxiety, or a purely coincidental event. If I talk about more examples, Extensive swelling, limb swelling following DPT vaccine is an example of vaccine product related reaction. <clears throat> now, suppose there is a manufacturer company and they fail to completely inactivate a lot of IPV. This leads to paralytic polio. So, this is an example of vaccine quality defect related. Transmission of infection by contaminated multidose vial, immunization error related. Vasovagal syncope in an uh, adolescent following vaccination and fever after vaccination due to malarial parasite. So this is not related, right? Coincident. <clears throat> so reporters should not assess the causality. Okay, anytime when that AEFI occurs, we have to report it. Okay. Events to be reported according to the context, whether it is a routine surveillance, during routine surveillance, these were seen, or new vaccine, or a mass campaign, what is the context we have to know? Yeah. 
case reporting format. Um, so I don't think so it is important at your level, but uh, you can just, um, I'll just um, brief you about it. So this is filled by the health worker. Immediately, a pers the person such as the ANM who is administering the vaccine, health worker fills in the form. Okay. And then the medical officer, medical officer, uh, within 24 hours, he informs to the district immunization officer. And then within 24 hours, the state immunization in, uh, officer is informed. And then the, uh, the immunization uh, division of the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, this is informed. Okay. So uh, this person has, the, the health worker has the um, Form, and then what happens is that uh, she informs it and the medical officer, he will confirm and he will complete the case reporting form. Then all these uh, further processes are done. It's not very important at your level right now. Okay, so now let's talk about surveillance. <clears throat> so if our program has been run, uh, then uh, we have to continuously monitor it. There has to be surveillance uh, going around so as to we, so that we can know what is to be done. Okay, the surveillance, the shortest definition that could be framed for surveillance is data collection for action. And uh, WHO definition is, it is a continuous scrutiny of the factors that determine the occurrence of disease and other conditions of ill health. Surveillance is essential for effective control prevention, whatever it is. Uh, it is like, if I just summarize it, we collect the data, it's a continuous scrutiny, and uh, we determine by uh, is certain disease or ill health condition occurring. And then what we are going to do, we are not only just going to collect this data, but we are going to prevention and control. Surveillance is an ongoing systematic collection, collation and analysis of health data and dissemination for proper action. So health data is collected, collated and analyzed and then disseminated as well. Continued vigilance over occurrence and distribution of disease. Okay, so due to surveillance, we can maintain a continuous vigilance. Surveillance may be an active, passive, sentinel, community-based, facility-based, laboratory-based, or a comprehensive surveillance. Okay, so as you all know, active surveillance is where the health worker or anybody who's involved in the surveillance activity actively goes and collects this data. Passive is where the data is reported to the collecting person. Sentinel is the identification of the missed cases, surveillance of the missed cases. Then the community based it can be the surveillance may be conducted in a community facility or lab and co comprehensive surveillance which may include more than one part. Five steps in surveillance, collection of the data, compilation, analysis, follow-up and feedback. Okay, so examples are the AFP surveillance, AFP surveillance that we do for polio virus detection. Okay, so you should be knowing uh, about this a bit. How is the uh, AFP surveillance done? Okay, so acute placid paralysis cases, they have to be investigated, okay, to the collection of stool samples. Similarly, the measles rubella surveillance. VPD surveillance, vaccine preventable diseases surveillance. So these are all the data of uh, how many cases of each VPD we are having and so that we can plan our further activities. Now the key elements of this Surveillance is the detection and notification of disease condition, the investigation and confirmation of VPD cases, 
collection, analysis, interpretation of data. So all this has been discussed. Feedback and dissemination of results, prevention and control responses, surveillance data on PPTs can monitor the impact of vaccination on disease and identify the uh, high risk. Uh, Yeah. So identification of outbreaks, identification of the high risk areas. This is done under these are the key elements of this surveillance. Okay. One more thing that we should be knowing is supervision. Okay, what is supervision? It is the process of directing and supporting the staff so that they may effectively perform their duties. Okay. Surveillance is the continuous uh, collection, collation, and dissemination of analysis and dissemination of data. Supervision is the process of directing or supervising. Right. Okay, one more thing which was important here is. What are the datas? Okay, prerequisites for effective surveillance. Uh, if we have to do an effective surveillance, what are the prerequisites? There has to be standard case definitions. Okay, anywhere if you go, uh, anywhere if you talk, uh, if you talk about any disease outbreak or any even a small study, if you're conducting, if you're talking about any disease, you have to have a standard case definition <coughs> where you can. Define which case are you talking about, okay, clearly. Ensuring regularity of the reports, action taken on the reports, okay. Medical officer must be clear about what information to gather, how to compile and analyze the data, how often and whom to report to, what performer or formats to use, and what action to take. Sources of data for surveillance, notifiable disease report, okay. Sources of data can be a notifiable disease report, a lab result, vital records, sentinel surveillance data, surveys, vaccine utilization records, vaccine adverse event reporting system. Now functions. We have already discussed this, the function of surveillance. Supervision we have talked about. Now, supervision is a two-way dynamic and social process, okay? Because uh, for a specific purpose of fulfillment of organizational goals, by striving to maintain the required quality of performance through constantly supporting and assisting the worker to perform the best, okay? So, supervision has been defined as a cooperative relationship between the leader and as you all know the definition that we had just studied it easily summarizes the definition goals of supervision why is uh, supervision important so that personal and professional growth in the employees definitely and um, anywhere we are going to supervise it is the key to maintain standards persist in the delivery of high quality of healthcare services to assist and help in the development of staff to their highest potential, to interpret policies, objectives, and need, etc., of the organization, to plan services cooperatively, and to develop coordination to avoid overlapping. So, I think these goals you can if you just think about it. You can easily, uh, you can easily, you know, uh, think about them on your own. You don't even need to uh, mug them up. Okay. <clears throat> Similarly, to assist in problem solving, definitely to develop standards of service and methods of evaluation, to evaluate the services given, whatever services were given, to evaluate them, okay, to uh, pro what the progress made. What is supportive supervision or facilitative supervision? 
a process that promotes quality of all health system levels by strengthening the relationships, focusing on identification and resolution of problems, and helping optimizing the allocation of resources. So this is supportive supervision, okay? Positive supervision. not important okay so one more important slide which is the last slide of the presentation is uh the difference between these three which i told you earlier also that you should be knowing what is the difference between control elimination and eradication so what is disease control disease control is reduction of prevalence or incidence of disease to lower acceptable level Elimination is eradication of disease from a large geographical region or political jurisdiction. Eradication is termination of all transmissions of agent by extermination or infection by extermination of the infectious agent through surveillance and containment. Reduction of infectious disease prevalence in global host population to zero. Okay, so eradication. And similarly, elimination. Elimination is at a smaller scale, okay? So here, the transmission is in, uh, interrupted, but the agent still persists. In control, we are reducing the prevalence and incidence. In elimination, the agent still persists, but the transmission is reduced. Eradication, the transmission is reduced, and the agent also is exterminated from the population. So which diseases have been eliminated? You uh, have to, should be known, okay? So just try finding out which diseases have been eliminated from our country and which disease has been eradicated, I've already told you. Okay, so this brings us to the end of the class. If any one of you has any queries, just type your question in the question box.
Okay, so if we do not have any queries, we'll uh, wrap up the session then. Okay, thank you everyone. I'm ending the webinar.